the ebb and flow of being an entrepreneur. It's yeah. the unglamorous, unsexy part that nobody talks about. Yeah. And all my clients can do is make content. All they can do is continue to tag brands on social, organically, continue to produce and write the content that attracts a brand's eye. Mm -hmm. There are always people watching and looking, yeah. but yeah, you exactly. just don't know it. Mm -hmm. And just remembering that, being reminded of that, that's all they can do yeah. because everything else is out of their control. Yeah. Everybody, welcome to the Five Folds of Podcast, where we're talking about being an entrepreneur and multiple ways to make money for your family. I'm your host, Priest Gordon, and today we're going to have a fun show. I have Joanna Voss here, and we're going to talk about her business and what she does. How you doing? I'm good, Priest. How are you? I'm doing good, doing good. So tell everybody about yourself. I am a talent manager. I'm a Pisces. I love long walks on the beach. <laughs> I, I am from the East Coast, so I do actually miss the ocean. Being okay. in Denver is... Lovely, but I miss the water. Mm -hmm. um, I So as I was saying, I'm a talent manager. I have an agency representing all women of color, social media influencers. I love negotiation. I love yes. being a talent manager. I love this crazy world of the internet and social media. And I'm excited to dive into it today. Nice, nice, nice. So how did you get into this business? That is a really good question. So I will try and give the short version. Okay. I've been working for myself since January of 2011. Okay. I started as a nutrition coach and had a couple good pivots, as all good entrepreneurs do. <laughs> yep. From nutrition coaching, I went in to do, um, transitioned to doing more strategy and operations for small businesses, all serviced, service based, all mostly solopreneurs. Mm -hmm. Was helping them with you know project management, creating courses, launching ebooks, building out membership things, or just generally like running the business behind Keeping the scenes. It all lined up. Yep. And I love that. I worked in political campaigns for the first eight years out of college, which I loved. And so a lot of that skill set kind of was trained in it. I'm good at it. My brain kind of operates like that. So operations and strategy just came, comes very naturally, naturally to me. So I had this day and a half strategy session available for someone who was looking for help, you know, needed another set of eyes and ears on their business, but wasn't going to hire like a COO, mm. just was like, Needing someone to say, here's what you're supposed to do. Here's how to delegate, automate, you know, here's what you can do to up-level your business. I'll help you figure it out. I'll write you a plan, but like, go do it. And so this one woman, Lorraine Laddish, lives in Florida. She hired me to do that. She's an influencer. Was my first, this was like 2017, 2017. So influencers were not as mm -hmm. ubiquitous as they are now. Mm -hmm. Like they definitely existed. It was much more... Um, the big influencers were much more like YouTube creators yeah, yeah. Um, and then everybody else. Mm -hmm. Like there were not a ton of talent managers or anything like that. And so she had been looking for a business manager for a while. Our paths collided by a beautiful, like the way the universe does. Yeah, that's right. And uh, so she hired me to come down. I remember we first talked to my birthday. She's from Spain. We talked in Spanish. So like immediately nice. we got along really well. Um so anyhow, so I flew down to Florida, did this day and a half session with her. And I remember being like, okay, what's your business? And like, how do you charge? And what do you charge? And how does this work? Like mm -hmm. I loosely knew about influencing things, but it was yeah. not like it is now. And so when I was there, there were two brands that reached out to her. Oh, wow. And she was like, be my manager. Like pretend like you're my manager. So I was kind of like, okay. You know, we had just done her rates. So I was taking the information that we'd already figured out about, well, if you want to make X, you should be charging this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Took that, responded on her behalf. She was freaking out because I asked for probably, I think, three times more than she would have. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, but it's just math. Like, we just went through. Yeah. If, you charge, if you're doing this, you should be charging this. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. And so, responded on her behalf. Both uh, brands came back like literally while I was still there and said, okay, yep, that sounds great. <laughs> Which later I knew, man, I obviously didn't ask for enough money. But yeah. at the time, so then she had a second heart attack and she was like, oh my God, yeah. I can't believe you just got me that much money, yeah. like twice. Yeah. And so when I left, she asked me to be her manager. And I remember thinking like, well, 
that was kind of fun. Yeah. You know, like yeah. that was easy. Mm-hmm. Jokes on me. Um, we just got along really well. So I was kind of like, sure. I love learning new things. Um, I love figuring stuff out. I was yeah. like, I'm resourceful. This is like a whole other part of my brain. Mm-hmm. So I said yes to her. Was still doing operations and strategy. She is very open and transparent and just like talks and connects a lot with her community. So she was just sharing about the experience with me, of course, posting pictures, talking about it. And then other influencers in her world were reaching out because they're like, because she probably had about 19,000 followers on Instagram, which seemed like a lot. It seemed like a ton at the time. Yeah. 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 Um, which is funny because now I think Micro is up to like a hundred thousand. Yeah, which is which. Yeah, nuts. That's a lot of people. That's still a lot of people. That's totally. A lot of people. Yeah. Um. So, but the point is that she was a smaller, mm-hmm. you know, smaller size. Like, wasn't a big YouTuber, but she was making six figures. She yeah. was making a living off of what she did. And so, other people in her world started messaging her like, "Wait, there's managers for people like us who." You know, are not these big YouTube follower uh, creators who don't have tons of followers. Mm-hmm. We're kind of just small influencers. And at the time, it was a lot of blog content, long form yeah. written content, okay. and Twitter chats, mm. which is very funny. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> yeah. those were like the two deliverables that brands were wanting. So long story longer, she would just talk about me to other people. Mm-hmm. And through word of mouth, people just started reaching out. And so yeah. I kind of said yes to a couple people. It was all on the side. If you met me then, I would... I didn't talk about it. It was like mm, strategy and operations. Yeah, yeah, it was just like, oh, I'm like helping these people. Yeah. Loved them all. And then I had this moment where I thought, you know, I'm having so much fun with these women. I love them to death. Like, it's just fun hanging out with them, helping them, you know, earn more in their business, mm-hmm. earn their value to like see the impact of my work. And I had this moment, I think it was 2019, where I thought, you know what? Let me just do that full time. And then I'll put the operations and stuff on the side. So I mm-hmm. wrapped up all my, had a bunch of clients on retainer, wrapped up everybody. And I was like, let me just leap on into this world of talent mm-hmm. management. And I haven't looked back. Nice. So I kind of always say that like Lorraine sort of pulled me into it. I'm very grateful for her because that was what kickstarted this whole thing. Um, and now I'm like totally clear. That's what I should be doing. Mm-hmm. Like I'm, I love it. Everything I want to do business wise is all pointed towards how yeah. can I grow my agency? How can I support my clients? Like, how can I learn, do better, et cetera? Yep, yep, yep. I know, like you say, you're looking at when, when I first checked it out, I was like, okay, a team of all women. Mm-hmm. And everybody's got color. Like, oh, okay, this mm-hmm. is this is pretty mm-hmm. slick. I love how everybody has their own niche. <clears throat> they do what they do. And I think that's really a key to successful business of kind of finding out what you specifically like and what you're good at and kind of digging into that. And you it know? matches. Marries mm-hmm. perfectly. Yeah. Like, I could never be talent. I have no interest in being in front of the video, making recipes, filming. It's so much work. Mm-hmm. It is so much work. I'm very happy behind the scenes, <laughs> negotiating, just, like, doing my thing, and then mm-hmm. passing it all off to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you're thinking about, oh, so that's, what, 2017? That's, what, six, almost seven years now? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So how's, the, how's the yeah, instance, so how's the flow been of starting off with one and then I were in Florida. So you kind of work with everybody from everywhere. It doesn't matter where they are. My clients are all around the country. Yep. Yeah. Doesn't matter. That's the joy about being on the internet. Yep. 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 So think about that. Is how did you, uh, I know first off you just, you, mm-hmm. how did you start off doing your team? Well, technically it's still just me. Okay. Uh, I am a one woman show. So my team, team would be my roster that's more of how i refer to them so it's the women that i represent the talent that i represent Ah, so they're the ones that i pitch and uh negotiate and do the brand partnerships and speaking opportunities with um but in terms of like the joanna voss agency and my business i'm a team of one it's just me i have people that i hire for projects to help with you know design stuff or like i have a blog editor for my website but Mm -hmm. It's a team Which of is one. pretty cool. I like how you have it um, that the four you got set up. I get on my phone because it's kind of a big phone. I can see the two at two by two going all the way down. Mm-hmm. Pretty cool. How you got this set up though. Yeah, I slow. worked hard at that. So thank you. Yeah, it looks good. It looks good. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I critique people's stuff all day. That's what I do. I Me look too. at everything and like, hey, you know, this looks good. What's going on with that? So uh, it looks pretty good. I mean, taking that stuff out, but cool part. So all those women you have on your page and everything else, that's your that's your your roster. That's my roster. Yep, it has nice. changed a little bit from those pictures, uh, yeah. but it is that is my roster. Okay, 
Oh, that's a mean way of promotion, though. Mm-hmm. Think about that. You sit We're back and yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a mean <laughs> way of promotion. You sit back and just putting everybody out there, like okay, and then highlighting people. Yeah, okay, I get mm-hmm. it. Now. I mean, they are the product, right? They're the yeah. ones that I'm selling. They're the ones that I'm trying to close and bring in more, op- you know, opportunities for. So, yeah. I lead with my product. That's right. That's right. That's right. All right. So think about that. So, what does a normal day look like for you? <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> uh, there is no normal. Mm-hmm. Give you a couple examples. Um, the best day, the best normal day would be, so my job as a talent manager basically comes down to two things, which is being incredibly responsive to any brand that reaches out to my talent. So any inbound inquiry that goes to my talent, most of the time, 85% if a brand is interested in working with someone, most of the time it goes directly to the talent. Mm-hmm. Even if they have a manager, yeah, it just goes to talent. So my roster will forward me the inquiry. Mm-hmm. And then I immediately, like, this is one of the top things that managers do. Be responsive. So hop on the phone, email back. Yes, we're interested. Yes, Mm -hmm. she's available. Here's her rate. Here are a couple questions we have. Can you tell me more about this? Um, Maybe I'm doing it on an email. Maybe I'm doing a phone call or, you know, a Zoom thing or something. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's first and foremost. So if I am spending my day and that is all I'm doing, I'm a very happy camper because it means that, People are interested in my That's clients. Right. That's right. You know, we're at the end of the food chain, right? We're not, if a brand is reaching out to say, hey, we were interested in your clients, like this is the best thing. Yeah. So that immediately always becomes priority over everything mm-hmm. else is being responsive. And then the other thing is closing the deal. Yeah. So once I have the conversation, learn the information, pitching my clients, I'm like trying to close the deal, bring the plane home, how much money, you know, <laughs> biggest amount of money for the smallest scope of deliverables. Or, you know, what is the best scenario for both my client, the brand, so everyone, everyone's happy, everybody wins. Uh, and so if I'm just doing that back and forth all day long, like that's the best day. That's your happy, that's your happy place. That's my happy place. <laughs> um, other days are spent just responding to emails and kind of being in my inbox and maybe it's more being in the middle of projects. So getting the brief, firming up due dates, um, coordinating product delivery to my clients mm-hmm. so they can film things. It might be checking content before we send it back to the brand. Like mm-hmm. I will always put eyes on it. Just double yeah. check. Okay. The hashtags, the tags. Okay. Do you have all the required pieces in there? Did you follow instructions? Mm-hmm. Um, it could be organi- organizing my CRM and, um, you know, writing some communication to people just to stay in touch and be top of mind. And, you know, yep. hey, I just wanted to tell you I just signed this new client or so excited to share that so-and-so just did this project and it's been amazing. would love for you to take a look at it. Mm-hmm. Um, it could be working on my own brand, so writing articles for my website, working on some social media content, pitching myself for podcasts, responding to podcasts, like scheduling podcasts, mm-hmm. interviews. Um and some days, honestly, it might just be taking a break from all of it and, and breathing. And breathing. Yeah. 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 So, as a talent manager, just explain to everybody kind of, I know that was a uh, kind of a detail into it as well, but <clears throat> what does everything that you can offer to a client? Ooh, good question. What I offer, mm-hmm. and it does vary from some managers, is I mean, we all do the responding and negotiation. Mm-hmm. Any, if we all do one thing, it is that. Yeah. Um, so, like I was saying before, responding to brands, um, you know, negotiating, getting the information about a project. I also get all the agreements. I look through agreements. I redline them. I will edit them. I will get them to a place where I feel comfortable sending them to my client to say, okay, you can sign this. This is in your best interest. This is in the client's best interest. I also do a lot of project management. Mm. Um, so once the agreement is signed, I continue to continue to stay involved. So I will get the brief, get due dates, um, maybe schedule a call with the brand to bring them and my talent on a phone call to, if it's a big crazy project or sometimes if it's like healthcare, they always need to Mm -hmm. have a meeting, you know, a briefing call to walk through everything. If we have a bunch of questions, or maybe that creative could go in a bunch of different ways or maybe yeah. the client's a little vague. So it's like, okay, let's all get on the phone and just like Figure talk through. Going. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, what kind of stuff do you like from my talents page? Like what are some pieces of content that pop that you're like, Ooh, we like this vibe. What are some yeah. other ones where you're like, not this, like anything like that's super helpful. Um, 
I get all that information, put due dates on calendars for my clients, for my talent. And then basically like once it's in their shoes, I don't really stay involved um, unless they have questions. Yeah. I get back involved when they are done with the project or at least their content. And then I look at it, triple check it. Make sure it's all good. Yep, make sure yep. it's all good. <laughs> all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed and they have three story frames and not two and mm-hmm. you know, the reel's long enough and all that kind of stuff. And then I'm the point of contact sending it back to the agency. I also remain a bit of a buffer. So if the agency gets a little needy and maybe they're like, oh, I know we said we can, you know, take it on Friday, but like any chance the client, you know, any chance such and such person can turn it in on Wednesday. And I'm like, no, they cannot. Keeping them buttoned up. Yep. So like I I do that Mm -hmm. um, for for both parties, not just the agencies, but sometimes my clients are like, oh, can I have another day? I'm like, you cannot. This has to be done. That's right. Yep. Um, and all the way through to sending the invoice and then tracking it down when it is late. So I stay involved for the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Some managers do not, or maybe they pass it off to other members of their team. I'm small. Mine's, you know, a boutique talent agency. So I do stay involved for the whole process. I do, I don't say pitching because the association with that is that I'm going to spend hours just Mm -hmm. kind of cold emailing people um, on behalf of my clients. I do not do that. Um, That is a exhausting, very low reward Mm -hmm. (laughs) process. Um, It's a slow sales cycle. Brands take months to build out campaigns. So, Mm -hmm. you know, us recording this in August, it's like they're already figured out they're back to school, right? Those, those, you know, you got to pitch for like Christmas right now in the summer. So for me to pitch ideas, I don't, I don't do that. What I do though, is I plant seeds. So Mm, when I see opportunities, I'll say, Hey, I saw such and such casting, you know, X, Y, Z client of mine came to mind. Here's why here's information on them. Here's their media kit. Here's their TikTok. Here's a screenshot of their, you know, Instagram Mm -hmm. cities breakdown. Um, what else do you need for me to consider them? So I will do that for sure. I, I plant seeds all the time. I will, if a client of mine is like, oh, I love this brand, or let's say they've been tagging a brand a lot in their content, I will try and track down contact information for that brand mm-hmm. if I don't already have it and say, hey, just want to put this on your dots. radar. Such and such, you know, Laura just did this reel and like it's gone viral. It's got over a million views. L- you know, keep us in mind for any upcoming projects. Like I will do that, but I don't like pitch in the way people think about pitching mm-hmm. when you think about influencer marketing. Yeah. It's, crazy. it's hard. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. <laughs> that is very hard in this economy. <laughs> yeah. Now, when you're looking at contracts, do you have to run them through a lawyer? Have you looked at so many of them? You kind of know what's going on with those. So I have two clients that work with a lawyer. Happens to be the same lawyer. So I just send those agreements off to them. Nice. Um, the other ones, I know exactly what to look for. And so I just do it myself. And if we ever have a question, we I do have someone I can send it off to. Um or like if it's something that's not my sort of zone of genius, like a book deal or mm-hmm. you know TV, like if there's any sort of ancillary projects that pop up, yeah. I'm like, I'm not your person. Make like sure we got I can look at this and I'll see red flags, but I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, is that kosher? Is that not kosher? Because every industry is different. Um, but for the most part, it's I can read these things in my sleep. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good deal. All right, so let's get into negotiations. Yes. Because that's your thing. Let's definitely, do it. Definitely. So thinking about that is, so when you're ready to negotiate with somebody, how does that process work for you? Best case scenario, they are reaching out saying, we want such and such a client. Here's our scope of work. Here's the budget. Here's information about usage, how the client wants to use it, paid, social, marketing, mm-hmm. you know, different marketing they want to do with it, and exclusivity. Best case scenario, I get all that information and I can say, oh, okay, well, for this scope, actually the rate would be X mm-hmm. or, you know, or for that rate, if, you know, you don't have more budget, let's relook at the scope yeah. of work and like kind of mm-hmm. find a way to make everybody happy. Um, most people don't offer all that information, honestly, because they don't necessarily have it. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times a person reaching out might not be the main point person for the project. They may just be maybe more junior, maybe a different person on the team, you know, Hey, such and such person, reach out to these 10 talent and see if they're interested, available. Like, are they exclusive? Get some basic rates. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so that's when like the real negotiation starts to happen because it's mostly questions. I mean, honestly, yeah. that's what people don't realize about negotiation is like, it's a conversation. It's not black and white. It's not, I get one chance to yeah. like ask for the number and then that's <laughs> it. Um, it's a conversation. It's not black and white. And it's very much like a choose your own adventure. You know, you're asking questions, you're gathering information. So then you're like, okay, I have all my main questions answered. Therefore, with this information, the number is X, right? Because that's what it comes down to, basically, is budget. Or, oh, I'm still missing this bit of information. So, like, let me gather that. Yeah. This morning, yeah. actually, I got an email back. Uh, a, t a client of mine, Talon, had gotten an inquiry. It was for an alcohol brand. So I wrote back, and I was like, this sounds great. We're super interested. I just have two questions. It said exclusivity for alcohol. Is that all alcohol? It was a hard liquor company. So mm -hmm. it's like, is this also, she can't do beer. She can't do hard seltzers. Mm -hmm. She can't do canned cocktails. She can't do wine. Mm -hmm. um, those are all mm -hmm. very relevant. Like you yeah. need to have that information, yeah, yeah. especially for someone who does a lot of content in this mm -hmm. category. So the person wrote me back and answered all of my questions about exclusivity, yeah. except for exclusivity. So I responded again. Yeah. Like so I need, it's, I need this yeah. yeah. Um, so it's just, you kind of just like sometimes have to re-ask the same questions and like, again, just gathering information. I'm like, I can't give you a rate because I do need to know, well, how long, you know, yep. I need, I need, all the details. I need this information, yeah. Yeah. you know, if it's like, I have a client, for example, who has a dog, but like is not a pet influencer. Her dog's in her content, but she's yeah. not like a pet person. Um, you know, a pet company reaches out, the cost, if it's like some pet food company and they're like, oh, well, we want her to be exclusive to our pet company for three months. Great. Mm -hmm. That is a very low cost of exclusivity compared yeah. to like, well, she yeah. does health and wellness. She does a lot of mm -hmm. all things health and wellness, women's health, probiotic, gut health, you know, cancer awareness campaigns. Like, that's where she makes most of her money. And they want to lock her up completely. Yeah, so yeah. if you want to lock someone up and say you can't talk about any other vaccines because you're talking about, yeah. you know, getting a COVID vax, well, that's going to cost her. That's a, yeah. that's a higher cost of business. Yeah. So, like, it is very important to... Because you're cutting off all the rest yes. of their business, yeah. 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 But if it's, like, a dog company, dog food, it's like, meh. Yeah. That's fine. We don't... No I get one of those a year. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's no big deal. Yeah, nice, nice, nice. So I know you talked about before is... um. Like you made a post the other day, it's okay to walk away. Oh, you know what I mean? somebody reads my social. I, know, I, yes. told you, I told you, I told you, I told you, I told you, yeah. So yeah, you think about that, like you said, it's yeah. okay to walk yes. away. Yes, Talk about that, because so many times I think when people are doing business, they really don't realize, like, I don't know, in real estate, we love this thing. We say, you know what, I may not be the 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 person for you. And that always works out great, because, oh, well, no, yo, we, we, we can work together, but you always love, like, you know what? This may not work out. Mm -hmm. I may not be the right person for you. And being able to be calm and realize, you know what? I don't have to get every single one of them. It's okay. Something's going to come tomorrow. I tell people with day trading all the time is that in day trading, you have FOMO. Mm -hmm. So what that means oh, God, is, yeah. what that means is like you have your trading set up. So you're like, oh man. And then especially if you're on social media and you follow a bunch of other traders. And you'll see these guys making the 40, 50 K today. Like, oh, my God. So it pushes you to want to get every little oh, yeah. trade. This stock market isn't going anywhere. Right. <laughs> like, if, even if you miss the move, it's at 730 this morning. 9 o'clock, it may be another one. And yeah. if not, tomorrow it'll happen. Tomorrow's a new yeah, day. You sit back and you realize and write out what that is. It, it's different. So when it comes to doing your type of deals, how do you work that in and realize it's okay to walk away? It. I will say it comes with years under your belt of doing this mm -hmm. to have that confidence because there is very much a grippy feeling of yeah. like, what if I don't get another one? Yeah. Or like, what what if this is it? You know, and mm -hmm. and that also comes from a place of scarcity of thinking that there's no other opportunities yeah. left. Yeah. To your point, there's going to be some tomorrow yeah. and next month and next year. Mm -hmm. um, so being able to walk away, I understand that we can sit here and say this and be able to do that, but it only comes from yeah. being there and like not maybe walking away. And, you know, I always like think with a client when we're kind of talking through rates and stuff, it's like, if they're not really sure, and I'm sort of like, well, what's your number that you want on, like you've imagined yourself, project yourself in the future that you've done the partnership or you've just started it. And you sign the agreement and you're like ready to go. You maybe did your first piece of content or you got your first brief and you saw the brief. What's that number where you're not going, oh, God, I don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. 
right? Like, mm-hmm. what is that number where you are not resentful that you said yes? Because if I can't get you there, I don't want to yeah. s- have someone sign something because they feel like they should be doing it. And then from the, as soon as that ink is dry, they're already regretting it. It's like, well, that's going to be a bad, like your energy, your content, your vibe. I'm going to feel it. I'm going to hate it. Yep. It's just like, yep. I, I don't, life is too short. I don't need any of that. That's and right. Nobody does. Um, and the only way to get to those yeses is to say no to stuff. Mm-hmm. And I've also had clients who have said yes to projects because there's a little bit of scarcity or maybe they really, you know, want the project or there is that FOMO. Mm-hmm. And then a better project comes along <laughs> and it's like, well, now you don't have capacity mm-hmm. and now you're overworked and now you're stressed, yep. even for this good one that you're really excited about. Um, and so I try to, when like clients really want to say yes to something or maybe it fizzles on, you know, not our doing, but the other side and clients like really upset. I'm like, it's okay. There's going to be something better. Like the universe is making way for something better here. Mm -hmm. So try and remembering those moments. Um, but yeah, it's really hard, especially in the beginning. Yeah, It, Yeah, It really is. But I think if you just like think about as much as you can, you know, okay, well, how many pieces of content? How many photo shoots are we talking? Um, What's my cost to bring in my photographer, my videographer? You know, if you kind of are on the fence and you're maybe able to start breaking it down, if you work with a manager, taking out the percentage that they earn, Mm -hmm. like what's the number you're left with? And so sometimes that also helps to be like, oh, that's Mm -hmm. actually like take out 20% for taxes. Take out some overhead. You're like, well, Yep. Like it, that also helps people yep. as they're learning how to do that better. Take, a take home number is important. I think so many Ugh. times you think about that kind of stuff and realize I'm like, okay, what do I want to make from all of this? Mm-hmm. What is my end goal? And so many times people, like I said, they'll get in adventures and really said everything else they're doing and not really think about that number. Like, oh, oh this house I'm renting for 1500 bucks a month. Yes, you are. But you have to take out the mortgage. Yep. You got to take out the management fee. If you're going to have a company manager for you, then your capital expenses at the end of the day. You Taxes. Might be, yeah, you might yep. be looking at like like four or $500 a month. And that's like, is that really worth it? Yep. So I tell people all the time now, it's like, I tell people, I want you to think about the end game. How do you want your life to look with your investment strategy, whatever you have going on? Same thing you're talking about your clients, if they have too many deals going on and they're stressed out, they're too busy yep. kind of going on from there. So think about, okay, I can handle two to three different ones. But my flow, the way I want to go and kind of roll like that, you got other people like, you know what? I do this all day mm-hmm. and I'm game. Let's go. Yes. Some people are like, I need one. Yep. Because I'm tired. I got two little kids at home. I ain't got time for Let me do one. I film on the weekends. So everybody has to figure out their own thing. But I think when it comes to that, that communication between you and your clients and understanding what their vibe is and what they want, what's their level and everything else. And understanding also, I know you got some, you know, their weaknesses, you know, their strengths and like, okay, I'm going to kind of cater to that or kind of avoid those things with them Mm -hmm. as well. And also just to realize it's dynamic. Mm -hmm. You know, you can have all the time in the world and be ready to go because, you know, it's the school year, but then maybe you got to pull back because it's summer and now you're driving your kid around to sports stuff or camps or, you know, you don't have, 7.30 7.30 to 3, That's free right. in your kitchen to film recipes because you don't have people running in and out. So, you know, just realizing that it is dynamic, just with negotiation, like whatever number you offer, it's dynamic and fluid and constantly changing. Just, like, look at it in that exact moment and not compare to other stuff. Mm-hmm. Now, talk about that feeling. Let's say you got an influence you just started working with, mm-hmm. and let's say a brand pitches them. You're like, okay, so you come back with that number, negotiation, that is, let's say they're offering, let's say, Five thousand dollars for the particular deal, and you come back like asking for fifteen or for twenty, mm-hmm. and then they say yes. Explain that that moment of emotion for your client. Oh, it's the best. Yeah. I mean, one, it makes me look really good. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, that's always awesome. Not gonna lie, ego loves it yeah. for like half a second. Uh, it's great. I mean, I don't usually share like all of the details, it's not until I, you know, I'm, I'm sort of like, it's like best and final offer. Do I yes. bring it back to a client? Like, I'm not going, okay, I'm saying this. Okay, hold on. They're saying this. Like, this is just too much. My yeah, clients don't want to be thing. involved yeah, in that. Right. Yeah. But I will definitely have a moment of tuning my horn when it does, you know, 
okay, here's the project. It's, you know, 20, 20K, whatever. And they're like, oh, this is amazing. I'm like, I just want to let you know, like, the original offer was five. Yeah. And this is what they wanted. And, like, we got it to this. I mean, I will say that also for context, I think, too, because it also shows how much the brand wants to work yes, with them. Yeah. Yes, my ego loves sharing that. I'm not going to yeah. lie. I'm human. But it's also just like, hey, I want to let you know, here's what happened, and here's what they shared about how they made it work, mm-hmm. um, why they made it work, so you can know what it is. Because it also is a reflection of the creator, right? I want to yeah. boost them up and hype them up as well, because that's like being their hype woman. That's is- right. And their therapists are like the two <laughs> top things besides being their manager. So I do share it. And it's awesome too, just to be, I mean, that's just good news. And it's fun to share good news like that. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. Good stuff. I think about that. Like I can imagine, I know when I first started doing stuff and you're like, Oh man, it works out. Like it's just, it's yeah. a fun, it's a fun feeling when things really start working out. You like, man, this is pretty cool mm-hmm. stuff. You know, I sit back and I got into podcasting, everything else, and then people reach out to you like, okay. Now, I will tell you one thing, though, is that um, I love the, I guess you can say, you have to scrutinize. So 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 many brands that hit you up and you're like, listen, I don't, I've never heard of your brokerage before. And I'm not going to promote a brokerage that I'm not comfortable because mm-hmm. in, in the trading world, there's a lot of shady brokerages out there. A lot of them. And you sit back, you don't want to sit back and attach your name. To yeah. something like that. It's like, yeah, I don't care how much money I offer. Well, yeah, we do this and this and this, and we're really the. We're the number I've, one. Yeah, yeah, I've never heard of you yeah. before. So if I haven't heard of you before, like, I'm not going to promote your stuff, kind of go from there. Thank you for the offer. It's great. But no. Now, yeah. when some of the big boys hit you up, then that's a whole different level you have to look at kind of going on from there. So how do you have to, how do you, how do your clients deal with when you have to reject brands? They have no idea how often I reject brands. They are completely disconnected to how often I say no and what those conversations look like because they all just kick it over to me and then they're like, oh God, Joanna, don't tell me until it's a yes. Okay. And I have some clients where, you know, I always ask all of them, but I have a couple where I'm like, hey, you're doing this just because I know they're going to say yes and I know Mm -hmm. they're available because we like chat enough that I know their capacity for work at that moment. Um, so yeah, they are clueless and have absolutely no idea how much (laughs) junk I got to wade through and how much time I spend on stuff that doesn't turn into a yes. They are aware of it. They always acknowledge it. And like, I do feel appreciated because I know I spend a lot of time on, I mean, we probably say no to 80 to 85% of the things that come our way. Oh, wow. Also reflective. There's just a lot of like bad quality opportunities. So that's that's part of that number, which doesn't go away. No matter how successful you get, people think Mm -hmm. that it's like, Oh no, no, we still get spammed and get gifted and, you know, trade opportunities. Um, so yeah, they have no idea, um, how much, how often I say no. And like how often I reject brands. Yeah. Yeah. I know that you made a post. You were talking about the, um, I love, here we go again. I, I love that you, you read I, it. I, I, hey, you, my mom I, every day. <laughs> I, I do research like, you know, cause it's the same thing I told before. I think the more knowledge you have about just how things operate in life in general, you can do some different things. So many times you get in a situation, you just really don't know. Like, Oh man. So like before so many brands love to reach out and say, Hey, so they're giving you the non-monetary offer mm-hmm. where we're going to give you the T-shirts and the protein. And like I get I get hit up all the time about all the fitness stuff. I don't have any fitness content. Yeah, I work out twice like I'm crazy, but I don't have any right. fitness content on my page. But it's always, you know, their third party reaching out to you. Yeah, don't respond back to me. You respond back to this link here. You like, but you made a post. You were talking about how these brands will reach out and just offering the gifts and can you do this? Can you do that? It's like, no, you have to really understand and realize what your client really needs and realize, you know what, that little gift you're offering or the dinner or something else, that's not really compensation Mm -mm. considering that everything that I have to do. So kind of dig into that a little bit. Yeah. Can't pay your bills with free concert tickets. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Yes. Okay. I know, I know the one you're talking about Mm -hmm. the uh, say no to gifted collabs. I do want to say for the record, people listening at home that When you are starting out as an influencer and you are just beginning your content creation journey, you will be accepting free offers. You will be accepting gifted and trade opportunities. There is no way around it. That is the nature of the business. That's how everybody grows. That's how you build your portfolio. That's how you practice your, you know, like getting your whole system in place. And like, that's how you learn how to do sponsor content. So there is no way around it. 
the post I did was related for people that are successful and already earning probably, you know, six figures and up. The content that everyone's like, oh my God, I love, you know, such and such person's content. And like, I love your content. And like, we really want to partner with you because we love how it's fun and sassy and creative or whatever it is. They have a team to help them produce that content. Yeah, that's right. In order for them to be as successful, to take on as many projects as they do, they have a team. Mm -hmm. The higher you go up the pyramid, right? The more you got to outsource and bring on people to help and support you. And the less that the talent will do, right? They may not be as involved in the editing and maybe they have a photographer or a food stylist, right? You can start with some small um, or not small, but like less important roles to help, you know, you build. And uh, not less important. Food stylists and photographers are important, <laughs> but just maybe they help you with like on a project by project basis, right? Yeah. Before you have someone like full time. They have to pay that team member mm -hmm. regardless of whether they're compensated or not for going to a hotel or a concert or taking a meal, you know, they're paying for parking, their time driving, mm -hmm. they're paying for gratuity. Yep. It is an actual cost, cost out of their pocket. Cost for everything. And yep. then they are paying their team to go make the content that everybody loves anyway. So there's it, the math doesn't math. Like yeah. it's their business. You wouldn't ask anyone else to do this. It's like only in this space where someone's like, Hey, can I send you a, you know, I'll give you a free haircut and you, <laughs> you know, post about it. Because there's also like an exchange of the value of goods. Yeah. If you're a successful influencer, you could easily get four or five figures for a reel or a TikTok mm -hmm. for a hundred dollar haircut. It's like, again, that math doesn't work. Yeah, not at all, not at all, not at all. Yep. All right, guys, we're gonna take a quick break. I'm gonna get back with you in just a minute. All right, we're back and we're continuing our conversation with Joanna Voss. Here we're talking about all things negotiation, talent management, having fun, not taking sucky deals. <laughs> kind of doing our thing. No, don't take sucky deals. <laughs> yep, yep. All right, so we were talking before about um, how you passing up on just some garbage deals that kind of come to you, and I kind of going on from there. Mm -hmm. And also realizing that, you know what, another deal is going to come. So let's talk about uh, kind of helping your clients realize another deal is coming and what happens when they take their time before they get there. Like I say, deals, let's say your deal flow slows down. Oh, like right now, yeah. deal flow is very slow. It is not a fun, ideal time. It requires me to be more of a hype woman for my clients. Mm -hmm. And because their morale is a little low, you know, maybe a bunch of things have come in, but nothing's closed because I know that brand projects, they go in a different direction or it's paused or now they're going to do it, you know, Q1 of next year. Yeah. Um, so I do my best to try and communicate that to my clients so they're up to date on kind of what's happening. But there's a lot of times that I'm also just left hanging just like they are from brands. So it's hard. I mean, it's really a time when you have to kind of just dig deep into your faith and trust that it's all going to work out, that stuff is coming your way. You know, brands are sitting in meetings today, having mm -hmm. conversations, picking talent on my roster that they're interested in working with. And it may be a while before we hear about it, but you just have to trust that that's part of the process and it is all going to work out. It's hard, right? It's the ebb and flow of being an entrepreneur. It's yep. the unglamorous, unsexy part that nobody talks about. Yep. And all my clients can do is make content. All they can do is continue to tag brands on social, organically, continue to produce and write the content that attracts a brand's eye, mm -hmm. there are always people watching and looking, Yeah, but yeah, you sure. just don't know it. Mm -hmm. And just remembering that, being reminded of that, that's all they can do yeah. because everything else is out of their control. Yep, yep, yep. All I can do is respond, be friendly, stay, you know, top of mind with people as much as I can. I'm not in those brand deals. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not in the rooms. I'm not the one deciding budget. Mm -hmm. It's hard when stuff is not flowing. It is definitely hard to just, continue to rinse, lather, repeat on making content because you feel like, is this working? Is anyone listening? Is anyone paying attention? Yes. The answer to all those questions is yes. Yep. And it's just, you know, your brain that you have to mm -hmm. remind Calm and down. convince. Really, exactly. Yeah. Yep. yeah. It's, yep. it's hard though. It's definitely, I think, one of the things that like makes or breaks entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Just being I resilient. Tell, mm -hmm. I tell folks all the time, I made a post <coughs> yesterday is that you're not a failure. I guess as a day trader and everything else, you're like, Sometimes in your mind, if you didn't make a hundred thousand dollars that day, you feel like you're a failure. I guess you're. I'm waiting for that day. <laughs> it can get you can. I'm telling you, there is. I can show you the math. 
It works. It just it, it's a process to get there. But in the back of your mind, you're like I'm good. Everything works out great. Mm-hmm. But in your mind, if you're if they didn't sign three deals that they if they're not doing a deal with Coca Cola, somebody like oh my god, I'm a failure. Kind of going off from there. I realize like I'm okay. Mm-hmm. I'm okay. I'm doing good from there. But like I think so many times too is you have to realize how to ride things out. Now, one cool part is let's say you're doing all these deals, and let's say Q1, Q1 they're making some money. Q2, they're making some money. Are you advising them to, hey, I know you just signed for 40, 50K. Take some of that money and chill out. Because it may come a dry a dry season and make the Q3 may be mm. slow. Are you advising your clients on, like, how to manage their money to take care of themselves? Or are you kind of just letting them do their thing kind of roll? I am not advising them on how they manage their money. I do very high level talk about it. Mm. We do talk about saving and like having yeah. to put stuff away. It's more yeah. the sort of 10,000 foot view of yeah. the ebb and the flow. And just they've all been around for a very long time. This is not their first rodeo. Okay, so nice. they do understand that it's the best of their ability and my ability too. We save what we can when we can for yeah. these moments That's and right. build up that sunny day fund. Yeah. But no, I'm not involved in the day to day of managing their money. Yeah. I just try yeah. and make them as much money as possible. And then I'm like, here you go. Yeah. Do good Be with responsible. It. Yeah. Don't blow it all. <laughs> Don't make spend bad all decisions. in one space. Yes. Yeah. Kind of go from there and realize what they got to do on that. Yeah. Crazy stuff. All right. So think about that. Let's get into uh, the, I guess you can say, the top tips you can talk about for negotiation. Mm. Two things that come to mind. The first one is in order to be good at it, everybody listening at home, this is important, so pay attention. Um, in order to be good at it, you have got to flex the muscle and build the muscle. It's like everything else. Mm-hmm. You cannot get good at it without practicing. Yeah. You're not just going to wake up and be good at negotiation. I do yeah. this all day long, and I still flex and practice that muscle as many times as possible. Mm-hmm. On that note, because I know people are like, oh, my God, Joanna, but I can't write $1,000 to a brand, right? Like maybe that's a big ass for them, or maybe mm-hmm. asking for 10000 or 50000 is a lot. My advice for people who want to get better at negotiation is practice in low risk situations where Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter and you don't have any skin in the game. Mm -hmm. For example, I'm going to give you two examples. Let's say you're going out with friends, right? Or let's say you and I are hanging out and we're out with a bunch of friends and we're like, you know, getting food, getting drinks. And it's like, hey, we just had this great podcast interview or my friend Priest is in town and I'm so excited to show him Denver. Like, any chance we get free round of drinks on the house? Mm Mm-hmm. Or like, hey, can we get free appetizers? Or you're at a store and you just make a really big purchase. Hey, I just spent $250 with you. Um, can you throw in those pillows for free? Can you give mm-hmm. me 10% off my sale today? Yeah. yeah. Like, you're already going to pay for it. You're already going right. to do it. So I always just ask. They're not going to do any of that if you don't ask. That's right. You got That's right. nothing to lose. You're already going to buy drinks, buy food, make your $250 purchase. Mm-hmm. But ask just to like literally practice asking, even if it's this like lowest risk thing. So that's my first piece of advice. And the other example that I always talk about, this is one of my favorites, is I had to buy a mattress a couple years ago. Moved into an apartment that was two bed, two bath. My parents were coming to visit in, I think, like four days. So I (laughs) needed a mattress. Like there was no way around it. I was going into this mattress store knowing I was going to buy a mattress. And, you know, it's one of those big like mattress firm, whatever it was, like those big warehousey kind of rooms, right? Mm -hmm. There's like nobody else in there. There's like one random dude who's just bored out of his mind. (laughs) And so I walked in, he follows me around. He's just like a bad salesman, you know, just Mm -hmm. follow me around, constantly pitching me and like not giving me any space to breathe. And I think I found the mattress I wanted. I laid down on it. I was not looking at him. So I was like looking away. So I didn't have any like, you know, we weren't looking at each other in the face. And... I don't remember what the mattress was. Let's just say it was like 700 bucks, whatever. I'm making this up. I knew I was going to buy it. Yep. Like I was prepared to buy the mattress. That's right. But I'm like, eh, can, you give, can you give it to me for $200? That's right. Like, let's play. Let's have fun that's, with that's this. Right. I'm not making that's a right. joke out of it, but like, let's be playful. Mm-hmm. And he goes, oh, I can't do $200. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh. Hey, game time. Yep. Right. Let's game on. <laughs> like, right. let's go. And I just said it honestly. <laughs> Probably yeah. to be a little just like sassy and kind yeah. of like, dude, you're like up in my space. Like, I'm not yeah. like, leave me alone a little bit. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, he responded with that. So I knew immediately like, oh, yeah. okay, game on. We're going to be yeah. able to negotiate this. Yeah. 
I don't remember what I got it for, but I it was at least like less than 50% of what the list price was. Guy just needed to make a sale. Right. I need a mattress. I almost got free delivery, but they wouldn't have been able to do it in time. <laughs> but it's just like stuff like that. That's right. Practice. That's like right. I constantly me constantly I'm asking for things. Yeah. And I do this all the time yeah. because you can't get rusty. Sometimes you gotta ask for your yeah. numbers. Yeah. Um, so that's my first piece of advice. The second one is remember it is a conversation. Mm. It's like a choose your own adventure. Yeah. Uh, I have a lot of people reach out to me. Um, I call them baby influencers, like people that are just starting their yeah. influencer content creator journey. And they're very attached to it being an all or nothing. Like Joanna, the brand said, you know, email me this. What do I say? Mm -hmm. And it's like they have one chance to say the right thing or it's just going to poof, disappear. Yeah. And Good. sure, they may respond and kind they may. Scarcity mindset. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. They may never hear back because. Sometimes brands and agencies are just stuck in their communication and like yep. that happens. It doesn't mean anything personal, mm -hmm. but remembering it's a conversation and it's a series of questions that is basically like a choose your own adventure. Yeah. You ask questions about the budget, you get to a number, then you pivot, you talk about the scope of work, the set of deliverables for you to match the budget offering. You talk about the exclusivity. Mm -hmm. Maybe you got the number up to where you wanted. Maybe you didn't. So you're like, okay, well, let's let's look at the scope of work to have it match so we're both comfortable. Yeah. Let's, re, you know, knowing next about the budget, let's look at the exclusivity mm -hmm. to see a way that we can just, you know, maybe tweak this a little bit so it's a little bit more to work with the budget and, you know, where I'm coming in at so I feel comfortable with it. Yeah. It's just that constant, like, if this, then that, but then that. So then you look at this. It's all just a series of questions and conversations. It's not it's this flowing. like black or white. Yeah, you gotta like mm -hmm. flow with it and just like have fun. And I think too, nobody likes talk. Minimal people like talking about money. Probably you, mm -hmm. me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, most people feel really uncomfortable. Yeah. So it's confrontational for it's them. It's very confrontational, yeah. and people yeah. take it per especially in this yeah. space. It's like I asked for ten thousand. They don't have ten thousand dollars. Yeah. It doesn't mean you're not worth ten thousand. It just means their budget doesn't have ten thousand dollars. I tell you, I had a guy who um, I was. I'm, I'm gonna get in public speaking a little bit later on in life, and he said the thing that changed his game was instead of telling them his rates up front, he said, "What's your budget?" Mm -hmm. And they would tell them their hit their budget, and he would make the pricing a, a kind of reflective of what their budget is. Mm -hmm. and he said, Man, "You sit back and you're thinking your your pricing is five thousand, and they have a hundred thousand dollar budget. You like." Oh, we can make that work. Yeah, I can, That's my I favorite can, line. Yeah, I can, we yeah, can, I can make that we work. Can, we can make that work. Yeah, we can We can figure that out a little bit. Yeah. I think we got to make some concessions and figure some things out. But, yeah, we can. Let me talk can, to my client, yeah. but I think we can find we can a way. Make, yeah, you're like, oh, my God. Yeah. Like, oh, my God, they have $100,000. Yeah. <laughs> yes, like, okay, wait, when it comes for a honey, wait, let's go for like 85, and then we'll see what some things are. Mm -hmm. If we don't like some of the terms, we'll go higher. But, mm -hmm. yeah, I was just going to ask for 20. Yes, I know. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, Think about that kind of stuff as well. I think about realizing, like, you know, asking what their budget is and kind of just doing your thing sometimes. I think so many people get they get caught up in, the, like you said, that confrontational. People get scared, and they don't really want to get in those conversations. Like, uh, I don't. They say, no, like, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. They're human just like you are. Yeah. They're running a business like you are. If they really, really want if they're serious, they're going to have the, commun the communication. But if they don't, it means they want for real anyway. Right, you know I mean? right. Yep. And I'm always, especially like in the space with influencer marketing, I'm like the piece, person you're probably emailing with doesn't have the power, doesn't have mm -hmm. the budget. You know, they're probably even more afraid than you are because they've got their boss going, really, we really want this talent. So yeah. find us a way to get that talent. Yeah. And then you're asking about budget and they're like, oh my God, what if, what if I say a number that the influencers turned off, right? They don't want to insult That's you. Right. They're thinking their same version of what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. So I'm always, excuse me, like if you can just have one iota more of confidence than they do <laughs> and not show how freaked out you are, it changes the power dynamic a little bit because they're probably more freaked out than you are yeah. and you're freaked out. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I think about that is like, you think about like, so that, that's a good point is that you're going into it like, Oh my God. Oh my God. Like, no, just be calm. And mm -hmm. It's, you're not going to die. You are not. This is very yeah, true. You're not going to die. You're not going to die. It's okay. <laughs> like, you're, you know what? They reached out to me for a reason, or we got the communication going back and forth. Hey, what's going on? And just be cool. But I think, I think, but also, like you said, it goes into experience. Mm -hmm. When you first get started, like, oh, somebody emailed me about doing some stuff for them. Okay, great. You know what I mean? But once you've done enough deals or you've seen enough and you realize, 
I'm going to be okay regardless of what happens, then it all flows. Mm-hmm. You start going from there. Because I think same time, too, like we talked about that before, how the scarcity happens. I think when the scarcity happens, then you got people considering the bad deals. Because, like, hey, I need some money, this and that. And it's really, I really don't know the brand. Oh, I don't like the products. I don't like this and that. But I need some money. And that's when you hear the horror stories mm-hmm. of they signed a deal with XYZ company who, like, perfect example, I think, so Tom Brady and all the rest of them, uh, yeah. I know that, what you're talking that about. Whole yep. Thing. Yep. I think he that lost sideways. Like, he lost, like, what, $40 million? It was something ridiculous. You know what I mean? And, like, anybody who's really in the stock game is like, yeah, that might not have been the best kind of situation to go with, especially putting that behind it. I think so many athletes lose big money because they just jump in with people. It's the Elway's notorious for making bad deals. Notorious. Oh, is he? <laughs> notorious. Like, horrible businessman. Like, That's funny. notorious for making. I mean, yeah, he has his dealerships, his name on a restaurant, but there are tons of failed things to get into. Because, like, you got a bunch of money. You need somebody like you in the way. Like, hey, this isn't a good deal for you. I mean, you should be checking this out. And I really wish that – more of the the NFL guys had because also their agents do things, but sometimes the agents aren't really good as well. I mean, it's a thing about the getting that 10, 15 percent off of that compared to like, you know what, this isn't a good deal for my client, or you know what, this really shouldn't be something we should be associated with. You got some good ones out there, but you hear it so many times, especially after their playing days are over. So now mm-hmm. they've played for 10, 15 years, and they've amassed you know, maybe $200 million kind of going on from there. And now it's like everybody, like, hey, let's start this business. Let's start this one. Yeah, it's going, yeah quickly realize, disappears. Yeah. Actually, don't even use your money to invest. <clears throat> use your money to get credit so that you can use the credit to invest. But most of them, they take, okay, all right, I, I, can, I can risk $10 million. And you lose that mm-hmm. all the time. So I think understanding what, what a good deal is, what a bad deal is, and realize it's going to be another one mm-hmm. kind of going on from there, helping people stay calm. Yeah, yeah. Rob Gronkowski, yes. former Patriots, former yes. Buccaneers. Yeah. He, I was listening to a podcast a couple weeks ago. He lives just off of his endorsements. Yep. Yep. And he, I love that he talks yep. about it. Yeah. Because, yeah, to your point, like players are getting millions of dollars, right? Mm-hmm. We only hear about the ones that are super successful. Yeah. And, no one advises them, right? Yeah. You yeah. maybe had money or didn't have money growing up, but like you come into a lot of money, there's a, a FOMO, right? You gotta like get the car, the house, the stuff, mm-hmm. all the material things. Like that money can MC Hammer, right? Another great example. Yeah. Yeah. All that money can disappear very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, you can do some of those same choices, but you know, work them financially a little differently so you're yeah. not just outlaying all your cash and like not investing yeah. or not. That's right. Putting money away in, you know, stock market or buying real estate or like tying mm-hmm. it up in other ways that rich yeah. people do to That's right. stay rich. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, him and Marshawn Lynch, both of them. Oh, I didn't they, know Marshawn Lynch. Yeah. yeah. Marshawn, they're okay. saying well, they, they live exclusively off <clears throat> of their deals. No, no, Rob was saying one of his interviews, he's like, at the end of the season, I think I'm going to buy myself something nice. He's like, I was hanging out with this guy. He had a nice little chain. I think I may get that for myself. And the guy's <laughs> like, dude, do you know how much money you make? He's like, well, yeah, but. Like he just has this the way he operates. Like mm-hmm. I've never spent any money, and it's a couple, a couple guy, like a couple linemen, people like that. It's just like I live off endorsements. People don't realize they getting endorsements that's giving them a million a year or stuff like that. That's plenty. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean, mm-hmm. now, I think the crazy story was that or you, like uh, licensing their name and yep. image for stuff. Yeah, yep. just like stuff, royalties, the, autogra- the autographs, and all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff going from there. Now I think um, they always say that their their big deal is for their <laughs> second contract. So I think they were on the, uh, I think it was one of the uh, athlete, the athlete podcast they were talking about the kind of stuff where they get the first deal and you're thinking, oh man, I just signed for five million. He says, no, you did not sign for five million. You you signed for, but taxes, agent fees. fees. They, he said, the guy said, he said back and so he got the buying out, buying the Bentley and all the big crazy stuff. And then his agent's like, well, you owe this much for tax. He's like, I only have like $100,000 left. Yeah, till next year, buddy. I mean, that's why you see some of them, like, just really struggling. He says, so that's why that second contract, and that's why so many of these rookies now you're seeing, and, and obviously these guys are holding out because they they played three years, and they're really, really good. But they're still playing on this rookie the deal. Contract, and, like, yeah. listen, we need to negotiate now because I'm the, the number one running back in the league. Josh Jacobs is doing that, and he's sitting out now because he 
led the league in rushing last year. And he's like, I need a better contract. Mm -hmm. And then, then all of a sudden, the guy from uh, Indianapolis said the same thing. Like, I led last year. I need a better contract. So these guys are realizing, like, they can get negotiate these deals. So they're saying, like, I'm not going to come to practice until I get a better deal. And then it's like, well, they have other guys they can play. This, uh, this whole negotiation thing gets wild. And I think, like, with, uh, especially with athletes, yes. and especially too, because it's like always not a good look when it's like, you yeah. just got paid 20 million. Yeah. yeah it's, hard to, it's hard to support you watching you hold out from like, yeah. Yeah. Not a lovely contract. Yeah. You think about because we think about our, our terms, like, okay, we're making this much a year. Like, dude, you just got, but I get it. It's almost yeah, conceptually, like, I get it. Yeah, I get it because like th this is they are their own business. But I tell you, I think the worst negotiation I've ever seen. I am a Lakers fan, so uh, Schroeder, the year we won the championship in the bubble, he was on a team. I think we offered him ninety two million. Mm -hmm. He turned it down because he wanted to get out there and see what he was really worth. He ended up re-signing with the Lakers. Ooh. That hurts. That hurt. That oh, hurts. cause he got out there and nobody's like, nobody wants you, buddy. And it's like, oh, that hurts. you have a chance to sign. Yeah, I tell you all the time, you sit back and you see big money on the table. It makes sense. Sign it. Yeah, like, I, I understand you want to sit back and go for more. Sign. Don't listen to your ego. Yeah, don't listen to your ego. Yeah. Realize, like, go. Listen re to your rewind, mom. Your rewind. mom would be like, sign that's that. Right. <laughs> rewind and realize, you know what? That's a lot of money. That's not like even a small amount. That's a monstrous amount. Do the math. Yeah. They like do the math and kind of go from there. So I think when people come to negotiation, <clears throat> they, they kind of get greedy, realize, and it happens with so many industries. People are like, oh, I can do this and that. You know, we call it the heat check. I mean, you, you've made three three-pointers in a row. They shoot their fourth and just realize, okay, I'm not really hot like that. Mm -hmm. it, it calmed down a little bit. So check yeah, like that. it's called the heat check. You realize, like, you know what? I've had three good months of cooking and cooking. Calm down because that fourth month – all those three contracts might end, and now, hey, you know, oh, the economy just hitting. You know what I mean? So, so many things going on, yep. so people don't realize that. And if they get big-headed, it kind of goes on from there. So it's kind of crazy. So let's talk about any kind of adversities you've seen in your business as you got it all started. Well, I think great piggyback off of what we were just talking about is the ebb and flow of cash yep. as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. It flows. Yep. And it ebbs. And it <laughs> yeah. sucks when it ebbs. No yeah. matter what you do to set yourself up for success, it's the nature of the beast. Yeah. And yeah. when, you know, whether you're a one-woman show like I am, even more stressful. Like I have people that are, you know, have top management agencies and have staff, right? They have payroll they have to make and people that are depending on their paychecks and benefits and health insurance. I mean – I'm on my own. Uh, I'm on my own salary, so it's like Joanna Voss agency pays Joanna Voss. Mm -hmm. But I see what I lose in taxes. Oh yeah. oh yeah, all the different, you know, all of the things. Like, there's a lot more that goes out per person yep. that you know the employee doesn't see. Like the cost of business That's right. is a true cost of business, and so that to me is probably the biggest thing that is just the hardest thing to work with, um, especially in my world when it's out of my control. I can save as much money as possible and I run a very lean ship, very, you know, minimal overhead. I work from home. It's like me and a laptop, all I need is Wi-Fi. I'm grateful I don't have brick and mortar and stuff like that, yeah, you know, and vendors yeah. I have to pay and things like that. But it's still ebb and flow with mm -hmm. factors that are out of your control. You know, as we're recording this, the industry – this year, from what myself and a lot of other influencers and managers are experiencing, obviously not speaking for everybody, but it's it's different, right? There's The brands are putting a little pause on the faucet yes, for a right, minute or right, two, right. and just, um, I think, a combination of there's an influx of influencers. The industry has moved very rapidly, and brands and agencies are trying to keep up. There's a lot more platforms to source talent. There's a lot more platforms to help brands figure out and measure you know, KPIs, key performance indicators and goals and metrics. And was this, a, was this a success? Whereas, you know, a few years ago it was like, Hey, here's some money, go do a blog post or a reel. Thanks. And it was much more education and awareness, but now it's like, well, if I give you $5,000, I need you to sell 50 instant pots that are a hundred dollars each. Mm -hmm. Is that math right? That math is right. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's like, they need to see a greater return on the investment. So mm -hmm. 
it's a slower game to make choices around influencers. Um, talking to some other people on the agency side, they are hurting for senior talent to help run campaigns. So mm -hmm. things are just being paused because they also have staffing shortages of people who know and can strategize enough yes, around right. like what to do. Mm -hmm. um, there's agencies being bought. Um, you know, maybe they took their business one brand and said, okay, we're going to give paid media to one company. We're going to have an influencer marketing to one company, um, you know, one agency, and we're going to have our earned media, you know, run somewhere else. Maybe now it's one agency that's doing all those RFPs. So it's just a slower process or they've been with an agency for 20 years and now they're changing because they want to get into the influencer game or beef it up. There's so many factors. All this to say it's trickles down and impacts yeah. those of us. Um, it's hard when you hear like, oh, influencer marketing's a two billion dollar industry. You're like, well, where's that money? You yeah, know? Yeah. Um, can I just see a little sliver of it? <laughs> so yeah, I think the probably the biggest adversity, at least in this space, is that ebb and flow. Um yeah, that I think that would be my probably that would yeah, be my answer. Yeah. 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 Also you think about some crazy stuff going on too, is that so many companies are kind of doing it in the house now. Mm -hmm. They're hiring or they're, people. Yep. Yeah, they're hiring people to just sit back. You know what? We can buy X. We can buy the cameras and everything else. And you just make reels and TikToks all day. And it's it's weird when people are like, yeah, well, what I do is I do, like I'm in Comcast and they do stuff all day. Yep. I sit back. One of my friends in marketing, like, yeah, we're making the TikTok up. We're like, you doing that's that for the job? Do. You're like, yeah, yeah, that's what we're doing. We come up with ideas. You're like, oh, I got to be the coolest job ever. You sit back and kind of do that. I had a friend who um, works for Southwest Airlines. I was saying, it's just, it's, it's big companies yeah. realizing, you know what, we can have people in house. And if they do the math, they're like, all right, well, we're going to pay this much a year. But if you sit back and record the content yourself, then they get really good with their targeting and everything else that's going from there. Now, it's, it's still different than being plugged in with somebody who has a million followers mm -hmm. and can really get some stuff out there. But there's so many different creative ways companies are doing this. So I can imagine how you have those flows and somebody's like, well, we don't need to do that. We can just hire somebody. And then if it doesn't work, then they're reaching out and kind of going on from there. Yeah. Back and or forth. they pull it in house to run the program themselves instead of hiring an agency to save some money. Yeah. But then now you're giving this program that before was run by full-time people focused full-time on influencer marketing. And then it's given to a marketing department where it's also like, Oh, Hey, you're also going to do the yeah. influencer program. Yeah. And they're like, I'm already overworked. Mm -hmm. I'm already doing the, you know, work of three or four people. I also don't know how to run an influencer market. You know, yeah. the the agency might have more tools and platforms and mm -hmm. things that they can pay for. There's a greater cost to a small business to hire, you know, to, right. to bring on some of these platforms. So, yeah, there's a lot of factors. And I think yeah. that's what the industry is going through right now. Um, it's the nature of the beast with any yeah. sort of, you know, business and being an entrepreneur. I always tell people, Hire the people who feed themselves doing that. So, so many times you sit back and you let's say you are talented enough to do X, Y, and Z. Right. But you may not be, like I said, they may not be the most equipped to do that. The agencies may be better. So what you should really do is understand what your costs are. But if you can, hire people who feed their children doing that. Because they're going to be point. way better than you are. Way hungrier. You know I mean? Yeah, you sit back and you're like, okay, well, my video is edited pretty good, this and this and that. But and you look at the content like oh, I really didn't come out that good. So go ahead and hire an editor. Right. Find somebody who does it. Understand. Get a package worked out with them. Tell them what you need. Y'all listen. This is my budget. Can you work out something for me? Like yeah, you know what? I can do um, ten hours of content for you a month based on your budget. Like you're like okay, that can be this many. You, you mm -hmm, can figure things mm -hmm. out going from there. But your content will come out flawless. Whereas. You're spending all this time doing stuff yourself, and it comes out looking crappy, and doesn't get the kind of effect that you want. So, realizing that kind of going off from that kind of understanding, like what you do well, what you don't do well, and finding people who do. So, I think that's really important because sometimes you don't want to waste your time. Mm -hmm. you know I mean? Or like if I hire you, you know, I'm thinking of people who do food content. Mm -hmm. They can hire someone to recipe test something mm -hmm. in an hour. That maybe takes them a little bit longer for whatever reason, because maybe they're more picky and, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. They just need to outsource it. Or there's some part of it that they can just outsource and like, oh, it's just a video where it's hands in the pan, right? It's not on camera. Mm -hmm. Well, they can pay someone who can mimic their style to do it quicker. Grocery shop, get it all organized, food style, you know, mm -hmm. all of it. 
they can pay someone quicker to get it done yep. versus them having it all be like, oh, today's my photo shoot day. I'm going to do that project as well. Well, maybe their photographer's more expensive. You know, there's lots mm -hmm. of ways of, of getting it done. And when you're able to outsource, it is like one of the best, most efficient, smartest things you yep. can do. Yeah, my friend Brianna, she, uh, she's a baker. So she hired someone to just bake her main her main mm -hmm. piece of the cake, and then she comes in and designs them. She's like, yeah, she says I hate baking. She's like, I'm a baker. I love it. I love designing my cakes, right. but I hate the actual process of baking my layers. And she's like, no. So I hire a girl. She does it. She comes in on Tuesday, kick butt, take names. And I get I'm like, she said it changed her entire business yeah. because now she's doing the fun stuff, and then the other person can do the menial tasks that she really didn't feel like doing. Kind of going right. So you really or maybe like, you hire someone to like clean your kitchen after yep. you have a photo shoot. Yep. And they'll just, 20 minutes, da -da -da -da, done. Versus you're, like, tired and exhausted and you got to get, you know, dinner on the table and, you know, your kids are coming home from soccer and baseball and football, whatever, and you know, just pay someone as soon as they finish the dish that yep. you've made for the photo shoot, they clean it, yep. right? So they're, like, simultaneously doing it at the same time. Yep. yep. Now, as far as your agency, how how many clients can you handle? you still trying to grow. Are you kind of at your Ooh, level where you're good? Yeah. I am open to clients. I am always open. I, it's hard to say. I mean, if my clients all did 10, 20%, 15% more work, like if each of them just bumped up a little bit, I would not be here doing this podcast because I'd be like, oh my God, I have so much work. <laughs> like yeah. it, that's just the nature game. Kind of the ebb and flow of cash flow. Mm -hmm. It's like the same thing with brand deals. Mm -hmm. It, so yeah, if they were all doing a little bit more, then I would have no capacity. Yeah. Um, but it constantly ebbs and flows every month, every week, every year. There's always mm -hmm. just a cadence of some people are having their best years. Other people are not. Mm -hmm. If and when it were to be like, let's say I go home, check my email and everyone's got work and it's like, oh my God, it's crazy. It's like maybe crazy for a week or a couple days. You know what <laughs> I mean? It's not like forever. Yeah. So I'm always open. Um, because I do love what I do and for the right fit for me, bringing someone into my agency, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone I've brought in that I have in my world, like we call ourselves an agency family. We're super tight. We're super connected. Everyone offers more than just, oh, it's like business manager to, you know, talent relationship. We're all really good friends. We're all supportive. Like as entrepreneurs, there's definitely conversations I'll have with my talent where I'm like, okay, I'm gonna put on my entrepreneurial hat for a second. Because this is Joanna as an entrepreneur, not Joanna as your manager. But mm -hmm. how are you doing this? Or like, what's your system for this? You know, not related to talent management. Mm -hmm. And everyone like learns and shares from each other, you know, shares and inspires everybody else. So yeah, I'm always open, always open. Yeah. Um, DMs are always open, <laughs> um, as the kids say. But yeah, it's people always ask me that, like, what's my capacity? And honestly, you know, if you had 10 clients and no one was doing anything, yeah. Well, then you could have 10 more, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so think about this. I always ask people this. If you could go back five years, what lessons would you take from those to apply now? Oh, my gosh. Uh, okay, five years ago, what lessons? Oh, mm -hmm. I would have owned what I do and leaned in more to my authority at being good at what I do mm. and being a thought leader and a voice in the space. Mm. I'm doing it now. It's fun. But of course, this is the beauty of hindsight, right? Mm -hmm. Is I would have leaned into more of that five years ago and built more of my own brand around it. I love being behind the scenes when I worked on political campaigns. I love being behind the scenes. I was a campaign organizer and it was great to, get all these people in a room together, you know, for a Hillary Clinton house party. And then I would just be in the back. Like I didn't need to be up with all the fancy people and getting pictures and stuff. Like mm -hmm. I'd be like, no, I was the one who made this happen. Yeah. I'm going to be sitting in that corner cause I'm tired. Yeah. Um, and it's the same way with that now. Like I love being behind the scenes. I don't want to be talent. I don't really want to be in front of the camera, but I am doing more of that. My clients are pushing me to do more of that, which I appreciate because they're, you know, this is an industry we're all learning kind of as we go. And so there isn't often the talent manager perspective voice. Let's hear from creators. Let's hear from agencies and brands. 
talent managers have a seat at the table and we have a very interesting perspective around brand negotiations, what's happening in the industry, reflections on influencers, reflections on agencies, how we can all work together better. Mm -hmm. And so I am seeking out and owning more opportunities to be a bit of a face of, of this that I'm a part of that I love. So it is a little bit of like getting out kind of from behind the laptop, so to speak. Nice. Um, and just, I mean, I've closed probably close to $5 million in partnerships so far. Nice. And I've been doing it for quite a while. I know what I'm doing. I have thousands of relationships. I'm really good at it. I try and be super open. And I mean, you see my socials. It's mm -hmm. like, I try and be transparent and open and like no BS. And, you know, I'm constantly educating people that I don't know who are like, oh, what should I charge for this? Or can you give me feedback on my media kit or something? So like I try and be helpful to as many people as possible. Um, and so instead of kind of just doing it and being like, oh, I'm happy to help, you know, writing articles yeah. on my blog, it's like, okay, there is a void of information. Yeah. So I'm leaning into it to be in like my dream world. You know, I'd love to own the space on the Google, anything related to talent management, brand yeah. negotiation, collaboration. It's like, all roads come back to Joanna Voss, you know, yeah. JoannaVoss.com. Yeah. Um, like I want all roads to come back to me because, you know, I do think there is some space for people who are in it and doing it and giving real life experiences. There's articles out there for sure, but it's like some mm -hmm. influencer who, you know, did a collaboration four years ago. Yeah. They have a lifestyle yeah. blog and they just happen to rank number one for something. And I read it and I'm like, that's not even how the industry is anymore. That's right. That's not even relevant, that's right. you know? So it's like, I'm doing it real time, so I'm trying to share about it and educate real time. Nice. So yeah, five five years ago, me again, beauty of hindsight, <laughs> could have you know leaned in a little bit more to that authority. Great. Well, this is a great show. Thank you so much for coming. Tell everybody how they can find you. So I'm always on Instagram. Always on Instagram. Love hanging out on the gram uh, at Joanna Voss. I'm on my website. There's a lot of articles, a lot of blog articles and content all related to brand negotiation. If you want to become an influencer, a travel influencer, you know, how to negotiate better. Um, that's my name, JoannaVoss.com. And I also am on LinkedIn nice. doing a lot of conversations around just more of sort of the entrepreneurial business side of things. Mm -hmm. Getting everybody all buttoned up. Yep. Good stuff. Trying. Good stuff. I'm trying. Good stuff. Thank you so much for coming. Thank awesome, you for having awesome. me, Bruce. All right, everybody. This was the Five Hustle Podcast. Thank you so much for watching. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, please follow, subscribe, send me some like likes, comments, everything else <laughs> on there, kind of going from there. Um, if you listen to this on Spotify, same thing, Apple as well. But do three things for months. You like this podcast, follow it, and share it with your friends. Go hustle.